Every Christian is sure about the second coming of Christ, but nobody seems to know how or when he will arrive. This uncertainty leads to the weakening of faith for many, so here's the complete second coming of Christ timeline that is sure to strengthen your faith. But before we get into the details, make sure that you take a second to subscribe so we can show the world how many people are on God's side. Now let's get right into it. 2000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to earth, lived among humanity and ultimately sacrificed his life by dying on the cross. He rose from the dead, demonstrating his victory over sin and death and before ascending to heaven, he made a profound promise that he would return a second time. The second coming of Christ is a core doctrine in Christianity, focusing on the belief that Jesus Christ will return to earth in the future to fulfill prophecies, complete God's redemptive plan and establish a new kingdom. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. The second coming of Jesus Christ will be a momentous and glorious event witnessed by all. The Bible declares that every person on earth will see his return, accompanied by a shout and a trumpet, making it clear that this will not be a secret or hidden event. The Bible emphasizes that his return will be visible and unmistakable. Jesus himself taught that the wheat and the tares will grow together until the time of the harvest. This analogy points to the reality that both the righteous and the wicked will remain on earth together until the day of Christ's second coming, when he will return to gather his faithful people and bring judgment upon the earth. Here are the seven signs that will appear before the coming of Christ. Number one, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. The first sign of Jesus' return, according to his words, is one that many find remarkable. The phrase, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, refers to widespread conflict between nations. This signifies a time of heightened international tension, warfare and division on a global scale. While wars and conflicts have occurred throughout history, Jesus indicates that in the end times, the scale and intensity of these conflicts will reach unprecedented levels, affecting the entire world. Jesus also mentions famines, pestilences, and earthquakes occurring in various places. These disasters serve as further signs showing that humanity and creation are in turmoil. Famines can result from war, environmental factors, or economic collapse, while pestilences include widespread epidemics and pandemics. Earthquakes symbolize the instability of the natural world, reflecting a sense of increasing chaos. Jesus uses the phrase, the beginning of sorrows, which is often understood as the beginning of labor pains or birth contractions. This metaphor suggests that these conflicts and disasters are the initial signs of something far greater to come. Just as labor pains intensify before childbirth, these global and natural upheavals are the first of many signs leading up to the final event of the end times. These sorrows or birth pains are meant to serve as warnings to humanity, indicating that the return of Christ and the final judgment are drawing nearer. As labor pains increase in frequency and intensity before a child is born, these signs are expected to become more intense and frequent as the end approaches. Jesus calls his followers to be vigilant and spiritually prepared as these signs unfold. Number two, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Jesus foretold a time when Christians would be arrested, persecuted, and even killed because of their faith in him. He made it clear that his followers would be hated throughout the world simply because they are his disciples. This sign is not isolated to one region or group, but would occur globally, highlighting the growing opposition to Christianity in various parts of the world. This prophecy is increasingly relevant today. Reports indicate that more Christians face persecution now than at any other time in history. 
According to reliable data, more than 365 million Christians worldwide experience high levels of persecution or discrimination, which translates to one in seven Christians globally. In countries like Iran and North Korea, underground churches are often viewed as threats to government control. Christians who are discovered practicing their faith can face arrest, imprisonment or even execution. The growing hostility towards Christianity around the world, especially in areas with oppressive regimes or anti-Christian ideologies, aligns with what Jesus said would occur in the last days. This sign, Christian persecution, serves as a significant indicator that the time leading up to the Second Coming is unfolding. Jesus prepared his followers for this reality, warning them that persecution would intensify before his return. Number 3. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. As persecution intensifies, false prophets will emerge, misleading people with deceptive teachings that stray from the true gospel. These individuals will claim to have special revelations or authority, drawing people away from Jesus and the truth of scripture. Their influence will be significant, leading many astray. In the age of social media and digital communication, it's become easier than ever for false prophets to build large followings. Through platforms that reach millions of people, they can spread messages that sound appealing but diverge from God's word. These false teachers often present their opinions, visions and personal revelations as divine truth, and many people accept their words without discerning them against the Bible. Number 4. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. The Bible contains a prophecy about the future period of peace, prosperity, and righteousness that will last for a thousand years, often referred to as the millennium. This time will be so peaceful that even predatory animals will live in harmony with their prey, as depicted in passages such as Isaiah chapter 11 verses 6 to 9. The book of Revelation specifically describes this 1,000-year reign, but Christians hold different interpretations of when and how this millennium will occur. Amillennialism is a belief that the 1,000 years mentioned in Revelation is not a literal period but an allegory. According to amillennialists, the millennium represents the spiritual reign of Christ that began after his death and resurrection. They argue that Christians are currently living in this figurative millennium, experiencing spiritual prosperity through their relationship with Christ. According to this group, the millennium began with Christ's victory over sin and will continue until his return, at which point the final judgment will take place. Post-millennialism interprets the millennium as a literal future era of peace and prosperity on earth. They believe that the millennium will come about after the church has successfully spread the gospel throughout the world, leading to widespread Christianization. Once the world has been transformed by the gospel, this golden age will begin, followed by Christ's return. According to this group, the millennium will occur before Christ's second coming, but only after the world has been significantly influenced by the church and Christian values. Premillennialism holds that the millennium is a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth, Pre-millennialists believe that the millennium will only begin after Christ physically returns to earth. At his second coming, Christ will establish his kingdom and rule the world for 1,000 years. During this time, there will be peace and prosperity on earth. After the millennium, there will be one final judgment, after which God will create a new heaven and a new earth. According to this group, the millennium occurs after Christ's second coming. He will reign for 1,000 years, followed by the final judgment and the creation of a new, eternal order. Despite these differences, all views share the belief in a future time when God will bring about ultimate peace and righteousness, leading to an eternal state of perfection after the final judgment. Number 5. The fifth sign of the second coming of Christ stands out because it happens gradually and reflects different perspectives depending on which of the three views discussed earlier you hold. Post-millennial view. Post-millennialists believe that the closer we get to the second coming, the more the world will improve. 
They argue that social conditions are gradually getting better, citing examples such as the increase in women's rights and the widespread presence of Christian charities around the world. For them, these improvements signal that the world is becoming more Christianized, and they believe this process is leading up to Christ's return. As the gospel spreads, they anticipate a period of peace and prosperity before the second coming. Premillennial and amillennial view. Increasing evil. In contrast, both premillennialists and amillennialists hold that the world will actually become more evil as Christ's return approaches. They argue that any improvements in society are overshadowed by a rise in sin, moral decline, and global suffering. They point to scriptures like 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 13, which says, Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. These camps view the first signs Jesus mentioned, war, famine, persecution, as evidence that the world is becoming more corrupt rather than more righteous. Number 6. This sign is unique and relates to how Satan will be dealt with before the millennium. During the 1,000 years that the righteous are in heaven, the devil will be alive on earth. The Bible calls this the bottomless pit because Satan is not allowed to leave the ruin he has caused and there are no humans alive to tempt. The Bible says that there will be no light during this time and for 1,000 years he will have no distractions and lots of time to think about the ruin he has caused, the punishment that's coming and all that he gave up by his own choice. Finally, number 7. The Rise of the Antichrist Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself as God. The final sign before the second coming is the emergence of a man of sin, often called the Antichrist. According to scripture, this figure will claim to be God and lead the world into deception before Christ's return to defeat him. The Antichrist will directly oppose Christ and seek to replace him. This opposition includes setting himself up as a figure of worship, claiming divine status and demanding allegiance from the world. Global Influence he will have a considerable political and spiritual influence, uniting nations under his rule. The Antichrist's reign is characterized by a period of intense tribulation and suffering known as the Great Tribulation. The Antichrist will initially present himself as a figure of peace and will establish a false sense of security. This false peace will ultimately lead to severe trials and persecution for those who refuse to worship him. The Bible reveals that Jesus Christ will return to deliver his people from the impending destruction that sin inevitably brings upon the world. If God did not love humanity, he could have left us to face the consequences we rightly deserve. However, driven by his love, Jesus sacrificed himself, dying on the cross to offer salvation from sin. Sin, by its very nature, leads to sorrow and death, but Jesus desires none of this for us. His longing is for us to place our trust in him so he can grant us eternal life, one free from sin and all its painful consequences, including suffering, sorrow and death. Through his grace, he offers the promise of a life of joy and peace forever. If you made it all the way to this part in the video, you may qualify for our membership, so you might want to listen closely. It's an exclusive area where we release videos that we cannot show to the public yet. You'll get to see everything first and learn about truths that we cannot reveal anywhere else. If you want to learn more, hit the link on the left of the screen or check out the link on the pinned comment.